Hello, and welcome to Church at Home. My name is Andrew, and I'm so glad to be gathering with you. You know, in the midst of so much change and transition in our culture and our community, our mission at Nona Church remains the same, to help as many people as possible know and take their next best step in following Jesus. Now, the way that we're accomplishing this mission, it looks a little different right now, but we continue to see God at work. So as you're watching this, I encourage you, would you engage with us by liking or commenting or sharing? Because your engagement digitally is actually having a tangible impact on real people's lives to help them take a next step towards Jesus. You know, this last week I heard a story about a woman who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. She hasn't been to church in a while. One of our families has been praying for her for years. Last Sunday, she saw their post on Facebook about church at home and took her next step towards Jesus by joining our church at home service and then engaging with that family afterwards. Now, if you're part of Nona Church, you know we've been asking this question, who's your one? Who's the person that God has put in your path whose, whose life would be changed and transformed for the better if they knew and followed Jesus? In this season of social distancing, Consider how sharing this church at home content on your social media could be used by God to meet your one in the middle of all of this mess of the coronavirus and point them to Jesus. You know, if you're not following Jesus and you're with us, we are so glad that you're here. We're so grateful that you've entrusted us with some of your time and we would love to connect with you. We'd love to be part of your story and be part of your questions and doubts and wonderings. Some of you, you're tuned in live with us on Facebook or YouTube, you're on your living room couch, and we're so glad that you've gathered with us. I hope you're enjoying a tasty Sunday morning breakfast, and maybe you've already shared what's cooking in the comments below with our moderators. Some of you, you're picking up this video a little bit later, and we're so glad to be part of your week as we virtually gather and worship together. Now, if you're a kid, you're watching this with your parents, our Nona Kids team has prepared something really special just for you. And spoiler alert, it's an obstacle course. So parents, be sure to access our Nona Kids Church at Home content that we've prepared for your family. We have a special lesson for you about how to trust God even when we don't know what's coming next. And I promise you, you're gonna have a great time. As we worship together by singing praises to God and hearing from God's word, let's consider this steady truth from Psalm 145. It says, God, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Together, let's worship our powerful and loving God who raises us up by raising our voices and our hallelujahs to praise I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah, oh, louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah.
peace Bring it all in peace The storm surrounding me Let it break At your name still Call the sea to still Rage in me to still Every wave At your name expectations. Over a decade ago, Stacy and I celebrated our wedding together right here in Orlando, and it was something I'll remember for a lifetime. We celebrated with over 300 of our closest friends and another 50 we didn't invite who showed up anyway, and we had a great time. We sang, we laughed, we danced, 
And while the wedding was fun, we were most excited for our honeymoon. We had a room booked at a nice hotel and a seven day cruise planned the next day to some of our favorite spots in the Caribbean. Needless to say, Stacy and I both had some high expectations for our honeymoon together. And then the bottom fell out. The morning we woke up after our wedding, I was burning with a fever. I mean, on fire. And that fever did not go away for multiple days on our cruise. So within 48 hours of our wedding, Stacy and I were quarantined in our cabin and not for a good reason. I don't remember much of that trip, but I do remember spending way more time in the bottom of a boat with an Eastern European doctor named Sergey, who wore unnecessarily short shorts than I did with my new wife. I was irritated. This was not how I expected my honeymoon to be. Have you ever had unmet expectations? Uh, in life, we all have expectations, don't we? Whether or not we admit it. And then, of course, there's what we expect in our mind, and then there is what we experience in real life. And what we do with the space in between our experience and expectations will either make us or break us. Today, as we continue in our series, Peter, Flawed but Faithful, we're going to see Peter and Jesus engage with another around unmet expectations. Jesus sees life one way and Peter sees it differently, and it gets pretty awkward. So meet me in your Bibles or in your app in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 33. Today I'm going to read a little, talk a little, and leave you with two questions that I want you to wrestle with in your families, your community groups, and in your hearts. So let's pick it up in verse 27, and we find this, that Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them this question, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? That's what everyone else thinks about Jesus. And then there's what you think about Jesus. Who do you think Jesus is? This may be the most important question you will ever ask. Who you think Jesus is isn't just defined by what you say, but how you live. For some, Jesus was a prophet. He was someone who spoke for God. Jesus was a good teacher for others. He was a Renaissance man of sorts with a new way to see and interpret the world. But to limit Jesus to either one of these would be to not take him seriously in history. In fact, C.S. Lewis, who was a one-time atheist who became a follower of Jesus, one conversation at a time at his local pub, and one of the most prolific writers of the 20th century, says it so well when he writes, Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for being a fool. You can spit at him and kill him if you want as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Who do you say Jesus is? Perhaps the most important question you'll ever answer. Now here enters our friend Peter. In verse 29, Peter answered, You are the Messiah. And this moment was massive. Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Messiah came with significant weight and it would be a key marker in Peter's life. In another recording of this story, Matthew tells us that Jesus celebrated Peter and called him blessed at this moment because he answered correctly. And while Peter was right about Jesus, we'll find out later he wasn't completely right. You see, in first century Jewish tradition, the prevailing belief was that there would be an anointed man, a Messiah of sorts, that would come to overthrow Rome, restore Israel to political and national greatness, and would do so as a conquering king. He'd be like a first century superhero who'd establish a Wakanda forever kind of kingdom. This is what the people of Israel were expecting. And this is what people following Jesus expected him to be. So while Peter was right that Jesus was the Messiah, his expectations for how Jesus would accomplish this goal could not have been more off. Perhaps this is why in verse 30 we find that Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So, verse 31, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man, this is a term that Jesus uses to refer to himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed after three days. Rise again. This was alarming news for Peter and the disciples. 
Because a defeated Messiah was not what they were expecting. They were expecting to see the Romans suffer, not see their best friend in chains. They were expecting to to be accepted by the religious elite, not rejected. And they definitely were not expecting their first century hero to surrender his life. And this is important because as Jesus was defining reality for his followers, they began to realize in that moment that what they assumed Jesus' plan would be wasn't going to be reality. And this, for good reason, created cause for concern. To some degree, each of the disciples following Jesus followed Jesus because of what he could do for them. They were hitching their wagon, their position, and their future to Jesus doing what they wanted him to do. And in some subconscious way, they expected Jesus to do what they would do if they were in his shoes. And they were excited to get the benefits that come along with it. They were expecting to follow a conquering king, not a crucified criminal. And imagine what this moment must have meant for them. Following Jesus now would come at a significant cost. Losing your life all at war with a leader you believe in, that, that's one thing. But following a leader who expected and told you he was going to die and suffer, that's another. Verse 32 tells us that Jesus spoke plainly about this, meaning there was no metaphor, no imagery. In other words, this was real talk. This wasn't one of his parables. Jesus literally meant what he said. So the text tells us that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, we don't use the word rebuke too often in everyday language. And if you do, you may want to catch up with the rest of us here in 2020, King James. But rebuke means to reprimand or correct. That's right. Peter decides to correct and reprimand the man he's just called the Messiah. And in some ways, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, Peter has seen Jesus feed thousands, heal blind people, walk on water, and raise people from the dead. Peter knows that all this talk about suffering, difficulty, and pain is avoidable because Jesus has the power to do what he wants, and it's definitely bad for morale if you're one of the guys following Jesus. I I could imagine Peter pulling Jesus to the side and and saying something like this, now, now Jesus, you know I love you, right? And and this this is a safe space. (laughs) Are you okay? All that suffering talk is spooking the guys out a little bit. I mean, I get it. You want to fire us up, but that one was a swing and a miss, man. I mean, Messiah. Listen, you asked me to throw my nets out to catch some fish, and I did it. You asked me to leave my family business behind. I mean, we've walked on water together, but surely, surely, Jesus, you're not leading us to slaughter in Jerusalem. Jesus, are you hungry? Maybe you need a snack. Maybe you need a Snickers bar. You seem a little bit off. You see, Peter pulled Jesus to the side because Jesus was not meeting his expectations. So the first question for you to process in your families or in your Zoom communities, and maybe even in the comments below as you're watching this live, is this. In your life right now, what are some things you'd like to pull Jesus to the side and have a chat with him about? What expectations have you been carrying that if you were honest, God just has not been meeting? Like, if you were in charge of the universe, what would you be doing differently right now? You know, I think for me, if I'm honest, it would be this crisis we're in with the coronavirus. I'd like to pull Jesus aside and say, hey, Jesus, novel coronaviruses are really inconvenient. People die, friends lose jobs, and Jesus, Easter is coming. That's kind of a big deal for us and for you. Can't you just snap your fingers and fix this? What would it be? What would it be for you? Maybe it would be, Jesus, I don't think my financial portfolio plummeting by 30% is a good idea right now. I was planning to retire. Or maybe it's, Jesus, I'm pretty sure that miscarriage was an unnecessary point of pain we didn't have to walk through in life. Or Jesus, I'm pretty sure I should be in a relationship that's going somewhere by now. After all, I've been faithful to follow you, and I'm pretty sure I'd be a better spouse than the rest of my friends that are getting married. They are messed up. Or Jesus, I'm pretty sure I'd be better off if if you just let me keep my job. I want to take care of my family. Now hear me, it is absolutely essential to tell God how you feel. Our listening plan through the Psalms in our Dwell app is filled with David telling God exactly how he feels. And it's essential to call hard things hard, just like Jesus did, to mourn them and to lament them. Hey, be honest with God. He can take it. But it's important to always remember in the midst of that honesty who God is and who we are. 
This was Peter's mistake. His actions indicated that he thought on some level that he and Jesus were the same. And it's one thing to complain to God, go for it. But it's another thing to try to correct him. And that line can sometimes be a thin one. And in this moment, Peter crossed it. So look how Jesus responds in verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. One of the reasons we know that the Bible is authentic is because of this moment right here. A few years after this incident, Peter would become head of the church. And as these biographies of Jesus are being released, Peter could have easily edited this part out, especially in Mark's gospel. And here's why. Most scholars agree that Mark was Peter's scribe and that the gospel account we have here is Peter's recollection of his time with Jesus. It serves Peter no advantage, especially in first century culture, to position himself as the one who messed everything up. And if you're a skeptic of faith or the Bible, small details like this are important ones to notice. These texts read far more like history than they do fairy tales. I mean, imagine this pitch for Peter. Hey, I'm Pastor Pete, and I'm sure you've heard about me. So come by my church because I flunked out of seminary and Jesus called me Satan. No one's going to that place. Talk about a powerful and embarrassing moment for Peter. Peter pulls Jesus aside for a private conversation, but Jesus reprimands Peter in public because of how dangerous Peter's perspective was. You see, Peter, Peter's statement betrayed what he believed. There was still a part of him that believed that following Jesus should be empty of personal pain and, and sacrifice. Peter had a mentality that, that was a mixed message, a, a message really that, that, that teaches if Jesus' primary goal for you is, is ease and comfort and the avoidance of difficulty. That kind of message is not the good news. I'd say it's fake news with real consequences. And to even maybe put an exclamation point on it from Jesus' perspective, that kind of message comes from the pit of hell. See, Jesus explains what Peter's mistake is when he says this in verse 33. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You know, I can resonate with that. And maybe you can too. In the midst of the chaotic season we're in with the coronavirus, it can be easy to be concerned more about our personal matters than focusing on what matters most to our Heavenly Father. And that's when we'll become frustrated. Because anytime we try to elevate our expectations of what God should do over what God wants to do, we'll find ourselves resentful and distant from our Heavenly Father because of our choice. Instead, I want to encourage you today to be honest with God about how you feel, but then surrender to Him the outcomes. In moments like this, it's important to remember that you can be right about Jesus, but wrong about His purpose and plan. I mean, Peter is a perfect example of how a sincere heart coupled with human thinking can often lead to disaster. I love how Michael Frost puts it. He says, Surely the challenge for the church today is to be taken captive by the agenda of Jesus rather than seeking to mold him to fit our agendas, no matter how noble they might be. And listen, if the Jesus that you worship would always vote like you, always think like you, and do what you do, you're probably not worshiping Jesus, but a version you've made up in your mind. But Jesus invites you to a better life. A life where you face challenges because it makes you stronger and more connected to him. A life where you acknowledge what's hard because the hard things can often be where the greatest gifts in our life are. And a life where if you follow Jesus, even in the fire, you'll find him there with you. What if on the opposite end of this whole COVID-19 pandemic, we had a better story to tell? What if we were more connected as friends and family and neighbors? What if we were more generous as a church and more essential to the life of our community? What if you were more in love and connected with Jesus because you made the decision to trust him in the midst of not knowing all the answers? Listen, that will only happen if we stop focusing on what we want God to do for us and begin to focus on what God wants to do in us right now. And that's the question I want to leave you with. How would your life be different if you oriented your heart this week and in this season to focus on what God wants to do in you far before you spend time asking God to do something for you. You know, I think you'd find more peace, more hope, and more connection to your Heavenly Father. And there's really good news for every single one of us today. It's that even when Peter gets it wrong with Jesus, Jesus never leaves Peter. Jesus would walk with him, teach him, and eventually trust him with what would matter most, his church. 
So when your complaining becomes correcting, hear me, there is grace. God is big enough and he understands. Because when Jesus is with you, he'll never leave you. And maybe that's what you need to know today. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm trusting that right now in this season, in the places where our expectations have not been met, where we expected you to do something and you have not done it. God, we were hoping for something and it has not yet happened. That Father, you would remind us that sometimes the most important thing in the world when it comes to your perspective in our life is not what you're going to do for us, but what you want to do in us in the midst of difficulty. And so God, right now we come to you honestly about what's hard. We come to you honestly about what's difficult, but we come to you with trust that God, you have a good plan in place. God, we're believing you for it and we're trusting you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, today we're gonna be singing a song that talks about how God is always with us, even in the midst of the most difficult seasons. And there's a part of the song that I really want you to lean into where you'll hear this refrain and this picture that God is with us even in the fire. And I don't know what weight you're carrying right now, but I do know this, that God is always near and he's always in your corner. Let's believe those things today. Grace when the heart is on the fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another. There 
is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So the way in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. Cause I know. Should I ever need reminding? How could you be to me? I'll count the joy come every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be. And I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where still. Shake beneath us as the prison walls came in. But nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I hope that during this time we have shared together you felt the closeness of the Lord and the togetherness of His church especially in this season of social distancing which can be so lonely and isolating for many of us You know, this week this is not a week to just hunker down in our homes and close ourselves off from community. Our team has been working hard to create next steps you can take towards community and towards Jesus while you're at home this week. More than a hundred of you, you've already jumped on to the Dwell app as we're listening to the Through the Psalms 30-day plan together. If you haven't joined in yet on Dwell, I would love for you this week to give your soul the much needed rest it is craving by downloading Dwell and starting to listen through the Psalms with us. You know, at the beginning of the year, my wife, Arielle, and I, we started using Dwell to daily listen to God's Word, and it has made our time in the Bible easier and richer and sweeter. You can sign up for the free Dwell account we have gifted you by following the link below. Tomorrow night at 8 p.m., I'll be hosting our first weekly Dwell debrief on Zoom. Uh, in this guided discussion, we'll look a little closer at a psalm or two from the past week of the listening plan. We'll talk about what God's been teaching us, and there will be a brief space for Q&A about the psalms as well. You can email hello at Nona Church to get the login information for this Zoom meeting, uh, for this Dwell debrief, or a lot of you can find it in the Nona Connect email you received on Thursday. You know, our team is looking ahead and looking forward to celebrating our living and reigning King Jesus this Easter. And although we may not know what's coming next, we know the one who's in control of all things. And we are actively working on creative ways for us to worship and to share the good news that Jesus Christ is risen in our community. You know, this week, you are not alone. If you don't know what to do next or you don't know how to connect, please visit our website, nonachurch.com, and click on the COVID-19 where you'll find videos, virtual community, classes, podcasts, playlists, and tons of other helpful resources. As we close our time together, would you stand with me? And if you're comfortable, extend your hands in this posture of being ready to receive all that God has for us. So receive this benediction, this blessing from the Lord that we find in 2 John. May grace mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Go with God and walk in the way of Jesus. We'll see you next week.